embarking upon a journey. You've probably seen these $300 Freedom kits from PSA, and you thought to yourself, how good are they? Are they worth it? Are they combat ready? Are they worth my cold, hard earned cash? Today in Grantham, we'll be testing this thing to the utmost using precise science, analytics, and an Asian in order to get the correct data that we need in order to tell you how good is a $300 AR. Before we get into it, we of course have to thank the biggest sponsor of the channel, Send in Dick Images. The Sonoran Desert Institute, if you're looking to get your start in gunsmithing, they are the people to go to. They fund our science. Yeah. They fund the crazy stuff that Correct. we do. They are a gunsmithing school, accredited. Go and check them out, we love them so much. And Micah, who can we not forget? Primary arms, and uh, I'm kind of sad we don't have one of their optics on the rifle to abuse it as well. Yeah, but I mean, you can get your own. Just use uh, discount code Kevin is lame, and see how it goes, yeah. And of course, if you want to get better at shooting, Mantis, so it, it allows you to dry fire when usually people would freak out. You, your home, parking lot. So Mantis is a <laughs> device that will turn your weapon into a dry fire machine, allows you to get that trigger reset and practice well. We love them. And of course, a big thank you to AAC Ammunition. They, of course, sponsor our ammo. It's all 77 grain serum matching. So what we do have to say is that AAC is a subsidiary of PSA. We are obviously going pretty in depth on a PSA upper. So there is the question of the fact that we're getting ammunition and we're doing a review on one of their uppers. What is the conflict of interest there? So here at Grantham, we're never told to give good reviews. We're never paid to give good reviews. We don't do that. We are always as non-biased as we can possibly be. If this sucks, it's gonna suck. And that's just the way it is. Um, but it should be noted, of course, that we want to be completely transparent as to the fact that we do receive ammunition from AAC, although nothing directly from PSA. So with all that being said, let's get into the test. Not once has PSA asked us to be non-binary with their product. So thank you, PSA. Now we are not documenting every single round that we're firing. We're doing a lot of training with this rifle. So understand that this, the point of this is not to burn the rifle down. We're not, that's not what we're trying to do. Now we are trying to do accelerated wear. And we're doing that with a uh, suppressor. It is a flow through, so there's less, um, you know, uh, back pressure compared to like a normal baffle suppressor. And we're running an auto, which is going to massively increase the amount of wear on both the bolt and the system in general. And if we wanted, we could just run mag after mag until this thing burned out. And every AR will fail around the 900 round mark if you just do them back to back to back. That's not the point. We're not trying to watch the gas tube blow up because that's what's gonna happen. We're trying to document for you in extremely hard usage, how long will this $300 rifle last? How, what is what is the wear pattern gonna be like? If we're running this thing like a straight up duty gun, like we would a URGI, how does it compare to like a $1,000 gun? How does it compare to a $4,000 gun? These are questions I want the answer to because I'm really interested. It's only $300 for this upper. Can it really hang with other uppers that cost four, six, eight times that price? Interested to find out. So we begin. The 
PSA. $300 upper is now at 2K rounds. We have just grouped it. I would say this is past the break-in point for a barrel. 2K for sure. Uh, yeah. So, Mikey, you... Well, I mean, we're also firing this on really fast, <laughs> a.k.a. auto. So, Mikey just grouped it uh, with 77 grain AAC. Go ahead, man. All right, take it away. So, uh, I was a little nervous using an ACOG, you know, just reticle and all that good stuff. But for the viewers out there, this is a 1 MOA square. So, I mean, if we were to put that up, we would be... <sighs> I would call that either an MOA or just under an MOA. Just under. Um, and then obviously I did have a flyer. This was my first shot. Um, You're a little nervous, a little nervous boy. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty blown away. Not only the fact that it's a three hundred dollar upper, the fact that 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 was with an ACOG. Uh, if that doesn't say that uh, it's capable, I don't know. Hundred percent capable, man. And we'll shoot it at six hundred now to show you that it's capable of making the long I, shots. I as think well. so. I feel like as a data point, we should probably run her back one more time. I mean, this yeah. was our first Let's do another, legitimate group. Another so. group, shoot her long, and then burn it. Continue to burn it down because fuck this upper, right? That is the first one. Honestly, dude, so you had that first round, that was that flyer. So this, these three would be like an MOA, mm -hmm. that would make it like 1.2, one one, and then one. the flyer was People one? would be like, but it's a five round group, it's a two MOA gun. It's still awesome. We're gonna be shooting at 550, 580. So what you have to realize about the combat accuracy of a rifle is the general effective range of 5.56, five, depending on the barrel length, Especially for like a 14.5 or a 16 in this case, is about 500. So we're pushing this what I would consider to be past the effective range. You can, of course, shoot 5.56 five, quite far after about 800, depending on elevation. But our point here is we have a $300 upper that is delivering pretty good performance. So we're going to show you the uh, combat capability of the rifle to make shots at the edge of the effective range of 5.56. Five, so without further ado, let's go ahead and shoot. So we are shooting 77 grains, which are most suited to these longer range shots. Barely under. You're skimming it. Gotcha. Hit. I left. Hit. Hit. All right. So, once we got our hold with ACOG, it was at the six, just holding right over it. 77 grain, you're gonna see a little more drop. The reticle is calibrated for a 62 grain M855 compared to the 77 we have here, which accounts for this, the discrepancy. That's a lot of words. Point is, as you can see, the rifle is more than capable of making a 550 yard shot, which I would consider pretty damn good for what we have. And we're at 2K rounds right now, and the rifle has no problem doing it. So I would say we have nothing else to do other than continue to burn this little bitch down. So we have been shooting this gun both auto and suppressed. This is going to massively increase the amount of heat that the rifle is seeing, especially compared to semi. So uh, as a consequence, as we near a thousand rounds, well, 3000 total, we're starting to get um, very low in lubrication. So it needs a little bit more. So we're gonna be hitting it with a little bit of lube. So this is a this is an old trick, right? So to see if the gas rings are still good on your... Uh... <laughs> oh think, boy. I think those are fucking worn, oh, my dude. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, right here we have a bolt from an SR15. So an SR15 is a very high-end rifle, close to 4K. Um, NATO death squads use them, a lot of high-end military forces use them. We have the bolt from this guy, closer to, I'd say about 7K rounds on this guy, and that supports the weight. Um, so I would definitely say that we're seeing quicker wear on the PSA compared to the Knights. Okay, we are at 3K total. So we're gonna go ahead and group her now, see how she does. Okay, we are at the 3000 round update. We are going to print for groups and we're gonna actually use a magnified optic. So we have a night force, uh, what is this? A 
2.5 to 20. Um, and we're going to group at 100 with 77 grains here, Match King, made by AAC. And we will see how we do. And so, as per usual, we've been having Micah group uh, on this particular test. So, Micah, you're up, buddy. Yep. You have enough in the mag. Okay. Dude, dude, you want to do one more group at the bottom? Yeah, we do another one. Yep, All right, go really bottom. Good, that was clean. So, <clears throat> I didn't pull those. Really? Yeah, that was the group for sure. Okay. Uh, I felt very, very confident. That last one was pretty significantly high left of where I broke. Really? All right, take a look at your groups, man. So, first group, that was wow. definitely an MOA or less. Oh yeah, for sure. Incredible, very good. Uh, down here, um, was it this shot that flew for you? It was this shot, and I don't really think it was me. I'm gonna be completely honest. Yes. Um, I, I, I'd say like, this is where they tend to go. Yeah. One shot went here. Yeah, so measuring this, would uh, be about 2.5. Here's a group I printed uh, right after that. It looks about a 1.5, 1.6. One. Consistently is doing about 1.5 um, at this point after 3K. Well, it looks like it's still printing great. Let's uh, continue to burn it down. We're at uh, today, started at 3K. We are now at, we fired. What is it, 15 mags? 15 no fucking mags, dude. And like, I didn't clean her from last time either. I mean, just like Grease with Charles. <laughs> um, she was running and we were shooting at 720. We're definitely seeing some limits of accuracy at 720, but I mean, that's beyond kind of the typical range most people are shooting. Pretty impressive. This bitch is hot. Holy shit. Poor gun, dude, we've been running it so hard. Okay, so we are now at, God, that's hot. We are at, uh, what, 990? Uh, yeah, we're at 990. Well, we also grouped with it. So over a thousand, so we're at 4K and uh, we're gonna let it cool off. We're gonna regroup and see where it's at. We're gonna go ahead, we're gonna group the rifle now. We're at over 4,000 rounds, see how it does. What? That's barely, that's 1.1. 1 .1. All right. So the gun grouped really fucking good. So we were getting, making sure they were on with this. I think we accidentally only sent four on this one, yeah. but oh well. We were making sure because we re remounted the optic. And this was the actual five round group. Uh, we're at 1.1 1 .1 on that. Um, side group, man.
dry. All right, we got a, let's see a failure to feed right there. You can see how dry the bolt is. We're at single shot now, so let's see if it's mag related. We got some bigger problem here. All right, switch over to semi. issue on this guy right here would you tend to agree Charles yeah I think so yep. ah, those shitty tan followers that's probably what it was Let's see if I can get multiple impacts Okay, Industries. I would say she was probably dirty as fuck. Yeah. Okay, that guy was super dirty. We fired about 1,500 rounds that were suppressed full auto and without cleaning it. And we started having stoppages. We cleaned out the bolt, just kind of a quick field clean. And uh, we're gonna see how she runs. She feels a lot smoother. See the super inconsistent ejection? Yeah. I would say we're probably getting close to um, the ejector being worn out. We're just at, at about 5K right now. So that makes sense. We're at 4,000. 800 or excuse me 4,900 or a couple mag shy of a uh, 5k so that makes sense to me um this is about especially at the firing schedule we're doing seeing uh a degradation in the extractor that's par for the course dude bolts are a replaceable item so um i think this is as simple as replacing the extractor and continuing the test this isn't uh favoring the weapon extractors are cheap and we usually keep them on our kit anyhow because Extractors wear out guys. So so after we had that little failure there What we did is we took the gun into our friends at stockpile defense and I was fairly certain That what actually did happen was that we had an extractor Spring failure or an extractor failure now. This isn't uncommon at the round count that we were seeing especially firing suppressed and full auto which if you don't already know is significantly harder on a firearm than just regular semi-auto and that's due to the amount of heat buildup. So in the case of this particular bolt, what we had was the extractor spring had worn out. Again, well within the um, kind of failure rate of a bolt, of a part within the bolt. You have to realize, again, everything is going to fail at some point. But the bolt overall seems to be good. So we're gonna continue the test, but before we do, we are now at five thousand rounds on this rifle mike are you excited very excited have we grouped it we're going to group it in just a second but before we do we have a very special guest our very own asian asian phil asian phil get over here tools hey thanks for coming on man hey thanks for having me hey what company are you with uh bear arms spelled b-x-a-r in san antonio texas hey thanks for coming out i understand that you have a severe amount of autism when it comes to the ar-15 so we wanted to have you out to take a look at the wear patterns that we're seeing on this rifle to see if there's anything that is abnormal at yeah, this point for sure. um and so before we start 
Obviously, you're not affiliated with PSA in any way. So do you swear before God and your witnesses here that you will be true and faithful? You will be uh, unbiased and that you will give your most accurate data possible? Oh, for sure. Okay, perfect. Awesome, man. So go ahead and walk us through what you're seeing on this particular rifle. Take it apart. Do whatever you want. And... Uh, get it get it going for you yeah sure so like i said i'm from san antonio so i'm not used to this weather so I'm it's bundled up right now it's a little cold so the most wear we see on the carrier is typically these top two rails right along here and the same on the other side and that's from the carrier being biased towards the top of the upper receiver uh from the actual hammer is pressing up against the bottom of the carrier. So if you can imagine the carrier reciprocating, that right here is where it starts cocking the hammer and that spring pressure is pushing up on the carrier, biasing it uh, towards the top of the receiver, which is why you see the most wear at these, these top rails. But if you look here, really interestingly, we, we don't see a, a very even wear pattern on these top rails. So you see wear at the front and then a little bit more at the top and then back here behind the scallop, a lot of wear or, or more wear really at the very top of this rail. And it really looks like it's not touching at the bottom of the rail. So let's show a quick comparison. So right here we do have an SR15 bolt. So this is from our Knight's Armament SR15. This is like a three to $4,000 rifle, generally considered to be a high quality rifle. Gucci, baby. A Gucci. So if you take a look at those rails and the type of wear that we're seeing, if you want to compare and contrast that. Yeah, let's just double check to make sure that we're a little bit clean. And you can see here already, this entire front area of this carrier, of this rail, uh, is pretty evenly worn. And then the same thing back here, we're we're seeing not a very strong indication that we're, we have uneven wear at this top rail. And then, here on the other side of the, the PSA rail, kind of the same thing. At the very front, we see more wear. And then interestingly, uh, compared to the other side, we see more wear at the very bottom of this rail. Whereas if we look at the opposite side, we see wear at the top, which is very unusual. So what is that indicative of? Is this a out of spec carrier or is this something with the upper receiver? Uh, could be could be either, could be both. Uh -huh. um, typically, if everything is perfectly round, you would see a more even pattern or, or closer to round. So depending on whether the carrier rails were not ground perfectly round or the upper receiver was not machined perfectly round, um, could be part of the problem. Okay, so we're seeing that. Is this going to be an issue, I guess, for the rifle? Uh, that's a great question, and I think it really depends. If your rifle runs, it's not an issue. If it doesn't run, it could be an issue. It is PSA spec. <laughs> if it runs, it runs. But no, this is always... <laughs> <laughs> so moving back from the wear that we're seeing here, mm -hmm. what else are you seeing on the carrier? Like, is the gas key staked correctly? Is it all looking good? Yeah, so gas key actually looks like it's staked really well. And what we mean by staking is these, uh, these indents at the sides of these fasteners it's the physical displacement of material from the gas key to touch the uh, fastening screws and that is to help prevent those screws from loosening under shooting vibration and funny enough uh, staking isn't even enough sometimes if mm. the fasteners aren't torqued correctly and then you stake over that it it could still come loose you would maybe be surprised at how many carriers I tear apart that have very loose gas keys even after being staked. Interesting. Now, from those gas keys, what else should we be looking for in the BCG that is going to be significant before we move on to other parts of the rifle? Yeah, so overall length of the carrier, uh, this controls a couple of things, but uh, there is a spec for that. We're gonna check for, uh, after you shoot it a little bit of more, course. we're gonna check for a leak between the gas key and the, the carrier. We're gonna check the bore diameters of the gas key itself, the bolt shoulder support, the gas ring run, the gas ring run, and the bolt tail seal. And we're also gonna check the bolt tail seal for how round it is. Jeez. Have you seen like the mathematical, the mathematical equations just flying then, by my head? So thus far, are we seeing better consistency from like the Knights, for example, which we're kind of doing a comparison with? Right, from the external wear patterns, which is really only the, the rails at this point, the Knights does look much better, much more even surface engagement between the rails and the upper receiver, a lot less wear on the side of the gas key. Um, it's 
it's pretty obvious to me that this, at least this combination of carrier and upper receiver is made better. So going from the BCG, we do have the bolt um, and like the cam pin. I know these are common areas of wear that can show um, problems, like yeah. especially if you have anything that's abnormal, like on bolts. Um, for example, we've cracked so many, sheared so many lugs off yeah. bolts. Um, so what I mean by that, guys, is, uh, well, let's use the firing pin right here. So these little lugs right here, um, these are a weak point on the bolt, and oftentimes as you're shooting really hard, you're getting the gun really hot, these will shear off, especially right around the um, the extractor mm -hmm. right here. This is extremely common. Mm -hmm. I've, I've sheared every single bolt you can imagine, from SR-15 to Daniel Defense to Colt mm -hmm. to, of course, you know, PSA as well. So, yeah. you know, that's always something that I'm concerned about with a bolt. It's something that I take a look at every time I clean them. I'm yeah. looking for that, those little micro fractures, yeah. and if it's questionable, swap it out. Yeah, yeah, so uh, a lot of people maybe don't think about it this way, but uh, I consider bolts a consumable item. Oh yeah, 100%. Uh, if you get over 5,000 rounds on a bolt, you're doing pretty well. And so it might be it might be time to think about uh, getting a replacement or, or swapping Especially a new one. Especially on like the Mark 18. Mark 18s are yeah. famous for sharing bolts yeah. on the 5K mark. Right, they're, they're very, they're tough on components, just a lot of gas, they're cycling really fast, full auto. The shorter the gun, the harder it's gonna be on parts. So like bolts and stuff on a Mark 18. Well, well uh, yeah. not, not actually necessarily. Really, okay, yeah, interesting. It's, it's the shorter the gas system. Okay, there we have it. Short of the gas system. Thank right. you, Agent Phil. No, oh, you're welcome, White Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're seeing uh, some wear on the bolt where we would typically see wear. So uh, at the bolt tail where it interfaces with the seal in the carrier itself, it's going to rub. Yes. So we see wear. Uh, the belt on the, the bolt itself, we are seeing wear and it looks very even, which is good. Good. Um, but we're also seeing like an interesting discoloration all over the body of this bolt, which is... Is it due to a shitty coating or is it... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's weird. I I really don't see this that often, but mm. it's whatever finish was applied is... Hey man, they got to save money somewhere. So doing one of the uh, down and dirty checks, you can insert the cam pin into the barrel uh, or into the bolt all the way and give it a little wiggle. This one, if you can see, got a decent amount of play in it. And that could be indicative of the actual cam pin hole on this bolt stretching. Uh, it's, it's pretty impossible to know for sure because we didn't check with these components when these parts were brand new. It could also be that this hole it was machined too large from the factory that the actual uh, barrel portion of the cam pin is too small, a combination of both, or it could be stretching. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can also check uh, the uh, ejector. ejector plunger spring mm -hmm. uh, and, and movement. So we're just, we're just using uh, our improvised punch. And we're just gonna give this a good feel and it feels pretty good. Yeah, the ejector didn't feel too bad for 5K of full right, auto suppress. Right. And it's moving freely, so we're not getting any like binding or anything like that. Some sometimes you can get burrs in any machine part. You can you can find burrs in places, and this spring can wear out uh, for the ejector. Uh, but typically, as long as you're using a reasonably okay spring, your bolt is probably going to break around the same time you would need to replace the spring. Here's the uh, the extractor for you. Right. And so this is the original extractor. We can see. Uh, pretty clearly where it was touching the uh, bolt originally, you can see that kind of moon-shaped uh, discoloration. And just from the, the general feel test, my hands are very numb, but I can feel it catching my finger, the, the, the actual claw portion. Uh, if I was more high speed, I'd be able to actually check the width of this cutout uh, for, for rim stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, for rim dimensions and but generally speaking, this extractor looks very serviceable. So are you saying just to pop the old extractor in there? Yeah, it's probably, probably. So more than likely, I think we determined that the extractor spring was the portion that was worn yeah. on this guy. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of the part wear that we're seeing. We're going to do more measurements after this, but uh, I think it's time to group it. We're at 5K. Let's see how it's printing and then uh, put another thou on it. Sounds good. Let's go. Okay. Yep, that's pretty not so bad so far. Nah, pretty good. <laughs> Open it up a teeny bit. Oh, 
not too bad. Not, you, that's you, not too bad. Yeah, will you print me another group low? Yep, got you. Thanks, boss. These all feel good, man. They're just not really going where I'm yeah, aiming. That was a flyer. Interesting. Cool. There, I'm gonna group one. Yep. Interesting. Those all felt good to me, man, but I saw two flyers out, right? That's kind of how I felt, but um, so, and I mean, you guys were shooting it long and you kind of felt the same thing. Yeah, so I do want to talk about that for a second. So we were shooting at 720 and we'll, we'll set up here and, and shoot it at 720, but we saw pretty good accuracy at the beginning out to about 3K rounds. And then um, when we hit this 5K, it, we started having some issues at 720. So I do think the barrel is starting to get a little worn. We're starting to get these uh, groups opening up, which um, the barrel should not be doing this at 5K. I, I, sh I do want to say, like a barrel should last, even on this firing schedule, it should last longer than, than 5K. Okay, um, so here's Micah's first group. Pretty good, we're gonna have Phil measure that in just a second. Here's Micah's second group. We started to see it open up as the barrel heated up. Here's my group right here. Um, these two felt good, and I did feel them kind of open up, which you were feeling that as well, Micah. This was what we were seeing when we were shooting far as the barrel began to yeah. heat at this wear point. Um, we started to see these rounds just not impacting where they should have in a very similar fashion to what we're seeing right here. Yeah. So I do think this is indicative of what we're seeing, which is wear. Um, let's go ahead and let's have Phil measure these and we'll go on from there. Okay, uh, our Asian has calculated this, which is hysterical. <laughs> and what did you get? Uh, looking at one and a half, just a little bit over one and a half MOA. Okay, so that first group, that's great. That's that's very acceptable accuracy out of an AR-15. Let's see what it opened up to, um, which I see, which I would say is probably more indicative of the actual accuracy that we're getting out of the rifle right now. All right, so we've measured Micah's group right here, and what was the measurement we got? We got 2.227 MOA. Hey, you know what? It kind of looks shitty, but at the same time, that's well within military specs for the M4 right there. Um, mine was a little larger. Uh, I'd say mine's closer to about three. That's not as big of a deal. We're going with a shooter that has been shooting this this entire time. So we'll say about 2.3, I'd say, is the actual accuracy and precision that we're getting from the weapon. Would you tend to agree, Micah? I would. I yeah. mean... I was actually very surprised with the top group. Yeah, I mean, so was the I. shots felt good, but the shots also felt good right there, and they just kind of opened up. Hey. All right, uh, we are now at. Dude, you know see. what those glasses kind of remind me of? What? Did you ever see Spy Kids? God damn it, dude. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Magpul. Thank you. I look like an idiot. <laughs> damn it, dude. <laughs> okay, so we fired two mags. That puts us at. Um, Five, five thousand and and sixty. Yep. Yep. We're at five sixty. So let's go ahead and uh, commence. Yeah, commence. That was a weird little. That was, dude. She's starting to have some some funk to her. Oh man. Oh no. Oh, don't, 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 don't wreck it out yet. This is the same thing that was happening to it before. Yeah, you're under gas, so it's it's uh, bolt over brass. If you can show the camera that, so you can see the it's trying to feed, but it looks like the bolt didn't get all the way back behind the brass. So that's indicative of under gas. Same thing. Looks like the gun is a little bit under gas right now. Double check. Yeah, bolt over brass. Well, didn't do it. It's inconsistent. I would definitely say that um, those gas rings ain't helping it at all. But she's gone, dude. So, to compare against PSA, we have an extremely nice rifle right here. This is a Mark 12-ish build from Micah Mayfield. It's got a what, Centurion Mark 12 barrel, and the rest is kind of a hodgepodge. But Centurion barrels are Headspace awesome. bolt, all that good stuff. So, this is a much more expensive rifle, and the point of this is to show... Um, I believe the barrel on this rifle is more than the entire rifle of the PSA. Yes, 100%. <laughs> it's a very nice build. 
very expensive. So you can see that there is a performance difference, just as a quick note. You couldn't even put the targets up straight, Charlie? They're circles. <laughs> Good group, dude. <laughs> Fucking great group, man. Okay, ready? Yep, come down low. Fucking great, dude. If not for that flyer, you would have had like a point three ml. I'm genuinely bummed out because that's the round that I had that safety problem with. But holy crap, that's one, two, three, four. That I legit do not count. I think we would have been all within here, and that would have been like a half. I ML. count it. Fair enough, we <laughs> count it. <laughs> you ready to measure? Love doing IP, man. Point eight eight. MOA with the flyers. With the flyer. Point eight eight. Uh huh point is you can see with a much more expensive brand and head spacing and matching everything up really nice and spending a lot more money how much did that cost you oh man uh well over two thousand dollars probably closer to three with with oh with the scope i mean okay 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 anyhow point is much more expensive rifle way more than probably seven times the price but here's the thing we definitely got much better groups better consistency however the psa is also working quite well uh, it's printing from about 1.5 to 2 right now. And it also makes those shots at 720, no problem. It's well within the operational um, envelope for the M4. So, yes, you can get better. Does it matter? That's going to be the point of the video. Let's find out. Five thousand, uh, six thousand, uh, in twenty rounds. So we group it. We set it back to the. We're gonna let this baby cool. Uh, we're gonna group it, and uh, then we're gonna give our final thoughts here, guys, because this is getting a little ridiculous. At the. <laughs> okay. She's done. Yeah, she's she's done. So. <laughs> More. Yeah. This so barrel's done, it's dude. It's done. Hey. All right. So I think we're at the end of the life of the barrel of this uh, PSA right here. So here's my group. Um, <laughs> pretty bad. And then plus with the size of the group, the entire size of the Pacey. Don't even need to say what yeah, size I'm aware it's just that bad. Uh, Micah didn't have any flyers. It is looked a little bit better, but still outside of M4 spec. So um, barrel's done. Okay, real talk. How did you think it was going to do as far as measurements? Uh, so I thought it would be way worse than what I found. There are there are obviously some spots that are not so great, but overall, hilariously acceptable. So the things that I inspected on the carrier itself was the overall length of the carrier, the bolt shoulder support, gas ring run, bolt tail seal, bolt tail seal roundness, and the gas key inner diameter. Overall length, 6.6740, which is good. Bolt shoulder support, uh, 0.5315, okay. Uh, gas ring chamber was not great on this. So yeah. it gauged larger than 0 0.501, which is, uh, I don't have pin gauges bigger than that. So it could, it could have been even bigger than oh, that. And what could be some of the problems that could uh, be run into from that? Uh, just since that is the surface that the gas ring on the the gas rings on the bolt actually seal against if it's too big you could start seeing gas leak around the gas rings sooner as as they wear out with time that's going to allow more gas into the receivers then right it can and just it it won't allow the because the bolt is the piston and the AR of course. and so it won't allow the action to exert as much force to, to like cycle the weapon so probably why we were seeing those those uh, bolt over brass malfunctions quite possibly yeah and on top of that uh, 
uh, brought the borescope out to take a look at some things. I took a look at the uh, gas ring chamber in the carrier as well with the borescope and it is exceptionally rough. So you can see very obvious machining marks on the inside of the gas ring chamber in the carrier and as the bolt moves in and out in the carrier, the gas rings obviously have to go over that in they, they reciprocate in that bore and so the rougher that bore is the faster your gas rings could wear out interesting which is which could explain why the gas rings on the psa are worn out and the gas rings on the knights are, are still okay interesting if okay. they have similar because even though they have similar round counts on them interesting okay uh not only that but uh the the one spot i i was for sure that the psa bolt carrier would fail is the roundness test of the bolt tail seal itself. Bolt, uh, the bolt tail seal itself measured at 0 .2, uh, 0 0.252, which is good. Uh, and the roundness. So if you if you consider the pin gauge that, that I've been using mm -hmm. as a true reference of round, and you stick the largest pin gauge you can fit in there and then shine a light uh, through the front of the BCG and look at it, if you can see light around the pin gauge, and if we assume that the pin gauge is round, light around the pin gauge means that the carrier is not round or the carrier seal is not round. We did see a little bit of light, but not to the point where it was excessive. And yes. interestingly enough, I've seen a lot of high-end BCGs fail that test. PSA, let's go. You know, <laughs> it, we, we could have gotten lucky with, with our one example, but this this one that checked out and that's that's very impressive to me. Uh, on the bolt itself, we measured the, the shoulder, the the shoulder belt area on the bolt, uh, 0.52695, which is small. And in my personal opinion, that's smaller than can just be accounted by wear. Interesting. Okay. Um, so that can let the bolt kind of rock in the carrier, maybe a little bit more than it really should. Now, again, obviously y'all shot the piss out of this and it was running. So Kind of. It was definitely having trouble towards the end. But I think that's definitely a gas efficiency issue where uh, like new gas tube and new gas rings would solve that, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, the tail OD on the actual bolt itself is 0.2494, which is a fail as well. Um, that, uh, if we look at the specs... Uh, which I brought... If, if, we, if, we look at the, if we look at the TDP spec... Uh, bolt tail diameter is uh, 0.2503 plus minus uh, two tenths. And so to be machined, we want to be no smaller than 0.2501. And so this is, this was in the two fours. What was it? Two, four, nine, four. So pretty small, pretty small. And I, what, again, what could I, be the problems from that. Uh, so if, if we consider, if we consider my hand as the carrier seal, and my finger as a bolt tail. You're getting Charlie excited yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the bolt the bolt uh, reciprocate back and forth and they interface with each other. If that teal if if that seal is very tight, uh, you get less gas leakage around that area. And if you think about it, it's it's pointed right at your face. And I'm I have a very distinct feeling that you'll get excessive. Uh, gas blowing into the action and like the the mark on your face uh, that you see and then also excessive fouling in the receivers itself I know you mentioned the disconnector getting dirty yeah, very dirty <laughs> it, it we don't know for sure but it's possible that bad seals in in those areas that can allow gas into the receivers can or potentially contribute to uh, fouling parts that you really don't want to get fouled faster than faster than necessary uh, other than that, and then the firing pin protrusion uh, we measured was actually very good. Uh, 0.0315, if I'm not mistaken, mil spec uh, is 0.028 to 0.036. So we're like right in the middle of that, which is awesome. So obviously we know where the accuracy stands, but what is the chamber looking like? So took the borescope to the to the barrel as well. Uh, the chamber isn't looking great. Uh, okay. You can see some very clear uh, machining marks. Uh, right yeah. So right now, in case the audio quality is different, we're recording on a phone, but we're able to get a borescope uh, with video recording features. And right now, you can see the chamber. That's 
not great. Uh, pretty rough, you can see all these machining marks. And then we're stepping into the throat and the rifling. You can see that it, uh, this kind of like alligator skin kind of looking uh, texture. There we go. Uh, that's fire cracking and that's per typical. Uh, barrels will do that just from, just from use. You can see quite a bit of carbon fouling, but the rifling, you can still see the rifling. Uh, some, a lot of copper on the, that though, but we're going to keep on going down. And if I lined up this pore scope right, we should hit the gas port at some point. So, going to keep on going. There we go, and our gas port. And so you can see at the top of the screen is towards the chamber and at the bottom of the screen is towards the muzzle. And you can see a tiny bit of gas port erosion uh, towards the muzzle end, but that's really, that's really nothing. That's, you're always gonna get some gas port erosion uh, after, after shooting, especially because these were shot full auto. Um, gets hotter, but that's normal. Ain't nothing wrong with that. We're gonna keep on going, see if we can't get a little bit of the, the crown. Uh, keep on going. Oh, I think we're hitting the crown soon, there we go. And so crown, the veg, it's not perfect, but eh, not bad. That's about it. That's uh. Some more on this thing. Well, uh, let's uh, let's continue then. All right, six thousand rounds plus, and uh, I would say the gun is done. So let's talk about what happened. Kind of do a post mortem, and then talk about what I think this rifle is good for. So a couple notes is that the rifle is now um, not gassed correctly. The both the gas tube and the gas rings are quite worn. This is leading to a lot of cycling issues. Micah, you had quite a few issues when you were trying to zero this thing, where it just wasn't feeding. We've been having these issues kind of begin to creep up since about 5,000 rounds, I would say. Um, the biggest issue I would say is that the barrel is, is completely done. So at 6K, I do understand that we are firing auto. We are only doing three mags. Uh, it's not getting it too hot. And then we're allowing it to cut, to cool down to ambient temperature, which it's quite cold right now, about 32 to, to 40 degrees. And I know the, the, edit makes it look like we were just rapid firing this thing but in reality it was three mags cool to ambient another three mags and it's been quite cold when we've been doing this so the gun really hasn't gotten all that hot 6k is very premature when it comes to barrel wear um and it's something that you should not see on a working rifle like a rifle you would use to you know to defend your life or something like that that being said um up through around 5k we did see good accuracy from it. It functioned fairly well, um, but then when it died, it died fairly quick. <laughs> Diff. Yeah, she went downhill very rapidly. I think right after about the 4,000 round mark, we started to see some pretty serious degradation. Yeah, we saw some degradation. We, we felt good for a second because at like 5,400, we were like, we went to shoot it at 720 and it was making impacts. So we're like, okay, maybe this is gonna hold it together. But, um, Looks like that barrel was uh, just barely clinging to life and just kind of gave up the ghost after that. So, you know, we have a rifle. Uh, if you get the entire rifle from PSA, obviously we're not running a PSA lower right now. Um, you're looking at a little bit north of 400 to 400, depending if you get a blend, if you just get the upper anywhere from 300 to 400 for a Freedom kit right here. Um, these are very cheap rifles, so what are they good for? This is something that... I would recommend to somebody who isn't serious about shooting. So if somebody is like, hey, I really want something and I don't have much money to, to spend, uh, I get it, right? Air fittings can be expensive at $1,000. That's a lot of that's a lot of time that you have to work to make that money. Um, so this is something I'd recommend to people who aren't going to be training with it extensively or anything like that. And I get it. Not everyone's going to be training to the level that I believe our audience trains to. Sometimes uh, you just got to mag dump some trash. Yeah, sometimes you got to mag dump trash, just have a good time. If you're just out playing with the boys and shooting with an AR-15, I mean, you're going to be firing on such a slow schedule. Generally, when it comes to our crew, me, Micah, Charlie, we're 
if you want like a, a good combat grade rifle at like the lowest price point, we're typically going to re recommend something like a BCM. Uh, it's a great all around rifle. They're going to run, QC's good, and they, they do very well. And then obviously, as you go up to better rifles, like we love to run LMTs, we love Geisley rifles. Um, these rifles are better, but the price point continues to climb very steeply for very small incremental um, you know, improvements in capability and reliability and stuff. So <laughs> when you go the opposite direction, the opposite happens. Getting down to the 300, 400 mark, you definitely have a big degradation in terms of the ability of the rifle to take a large amount of rounds. That's just life. There's no free lunch. I do want to say that I definitely appreciate where PSA is coming from and making such a cheap upper easily available and fairly good for what it is well i guess one thing that should be noted is our rifle is now shot out yeah we can simply call palmetto state armory true send it in and they will send it back with a new barrel a new bolt and all new parts and it's going to go you, for free and then you continue to go so it, it definitely has to be noted that that's awesome but again if you're looking for something for the end of the world where psa no longer exists and you can't send it in that's not going to work if you're just screwing around and you, you you want something to plink with, to shoot with, to, to have fun with, I really don't see a problem with this rifle. Again, everything has a place. Everything uh, can be made to work based on your situation. So this isn't us just saying this is a bad rifle. It's just to say, understand that this is going to wear out faster than a rifle that is made for work, that is made for combat. PSA is not, to be very clear. However, I was definitely very impressed with the accuracy that we got out of this rifle going up through the four or five K mark. And I think it's very good for the price that you're getting and for the customer support that you're getting from PSA. Now, with all that being said, you've seen the measurements from Phil, you know what you're looking at. You're not quite in spec. You are in PSA spec. This is good, baby. <laughs> with everything guys, what's going to be very important is training. So if we're talking in context of what do you have money for? I understand the economy sucks right now. Uh, money's tight, jobs suck. Um, if it was a choice between buying a BCM and no ammo or buying this and buying a couple thousand rounds, 100% buy those couple thousand rounds. Actually train with your rifle because I'm gonna be way more scared of the guy who trains with this than a guy who doesn't train with this BCM. Point is guys, everything has a place. Get out there, train. We love you guys. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, we got nothing else for you guys. Final thing for you guys, come here, Phil. We got dad advice with Phil. Phil doesn't have any children that we know of. No, none that I know except of. Except for the people of Korea. What's your dad advice for these people? Uh, let's see, oh God, on the spot. Um, you know, I think being kind is underrated Facts. in situations where it, it's, it, you would be, you would, it would be fair to not be nice to people. Uh, for instance, my local post office, the USPS, I'm very nice to them. If there's ever a problem, they help me out so much and other people just scream at them and they, and it's not, it's not these people's fault. So, you know, just even if you'd be right to be angry, just be nice and you will get farther. I like life. that. Being nice is, is definitely underrated. We like being nice around here. All right, guys, that's it.